Hey guys, Lamont here from Days of French and Swedish, and I'm here today with Luke, uh, who's from Birmingham, where it is snowing, it's snowing for the it's first snowing. time. And how long? How long since it snowed last time? Well, I, I, the last year I haven't really been in England, so it's probably a bad person to ask, but I'm assuming probably roughly the same time last year. You can see, maybe I can put my camera out the window and see. <laughs> see this. You can definitely outside. see. You can definitely yep. see that that is snowing. Yeah. So for for us, for people watching, which is everyone, um, um, <laughs> we're, Luke and I have been chatting for like quite a while now. Uh, and the first part, half of our chat, or the first uh, third of it actually, because then we chatted for a while after the video, but uh, we'll be on on uh, his channel. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you talk to me on your channel. Um, so yeah, make sure to check that out. Uh, I think it was a, a pretty interesting discussion, if I can say so myself. L Luke, do you want to give us a rundown of uh, how you got into languages, what languages you speak and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so I was monolingual most of my life until, and then I started learning languages at the age of 22. So when I was in university, this was a few years before I started, I was in the table tennis society. So I, you know, I was, I was president of the club. I met a lot of people from Hong Kong and China and stuff playing table tennis. And then after that, one of the girls in the society became my girlfriend. We've, we're together now. We've been together for like six years. Um, and she's from Hong Kong. So, you know, a few years later, after we have been going out for a few years at the point, I wanted to try and kind of speak to some of her friends and family in, in Cantonese because I thought, you know, if we're going to be together and, you know, wanting to like, spend my life with this girl, then it's a good idea to try and at least be able to, like, speak at least a little bit of her mother tongue. So I downloaded a few apps and stuff when it went pretty terribly. And then I'm not sure how it happened, but I started falling further and further down the rabbit hole and then became pretty obsessed. Um, and then I studied Cantonese for about two years, got it to a pretty good level. Um, and then after that, I decided to take a six month break to try and learn Spanish because I was going to Mexico. That was kind of fun. Um, and then I got information saying I'd received a scholarship to go study Mandarin in, in Taiwan. So I kind of dropped everything else and went really uh, intensive on Mandarin. And I've been doing that for like the past year and I'm going to get the date wrong probably a year and six or seven months or something like that or, yeah about, about a year and seven months ish um but like a year of that was very very intense and because i already had some experience with cantonese my mandarin got to what i'd say i call a pretty good level now but obviously still got lots of gaps that i'm trying to plug mm, but i mean lots of gaps in even even to say like a pretty good level with lots of gaps in uh, a year and seven months that is like that is turbo speed for for a language like mandarin i mean that's pretty quick for a european language but um that like so can you tell us a bit about what you were doing in that time um yeah well, when i first started there was a period of about four months when i was still working at the time i was working as a process engineer for this company that i'm not going to mention the name of but so i was working eight hours a day so i tried to like fit it around the schedule but at the time, this was, you know, pre-COVID when you could go into offices and take public transport without worrying you were going to catch something. Mm. Um, so I would, I'd basically take the tram. The, the the tram was across my road, so I'd walk five minutes to the tram stop, get the tram, which was about 25 minutes, and then do a 25-minute walk to work. That'd be total about an hour, and then do the same coming back. So what I did is I woke up every morning, um, and I started off. I used like some beginner textbook for the first month, just studying the dialogues in this book for like an hour every morning. And then when I was waiting for the tram, I'd do flashcards. When I was on the tram, I'd review the lesson on Link or do something like that. And then when I was walking, I'd listen to the dialogues on loop again. So I just kind of did that every day for the first few months while also coupling that with lots of extensive immersion in the nighttime, just kind of relaxing and watching a lot of uh, like TV dramas and stuff. Because I knew quite a bit of Cantonese already, I had a big head start with the characters, so I could kind of jump into reading generally quite quickly. And my reading was a lot better than my listening for a very long time. I mean, it's still better now, but like the, the gap's a lot smaller. Um, mm -hmm. So I did that, and then after like went through two beginner-ish textbooks, which was the um, complete what's it called contemporary Chinese course from NTNU University. I went through the first two textbooks for that. And then after that, I just started doing the same routine, but with YouTube videos from YouTubers using the CC subtitles and porting that into Link. Um, did that for another two months, and then I went to 
Taiwan. And then when I was in Taiwan, then my routine was basically read for an hour to an hour and a half in the morning, go to three hours of class, get off class, write homework for an hour. And then in the afternoons, either hang out with my friends, which would be in Taiwanese, which were Taiwanese people most of the time, or sometimes my classmates, which would speak Chinese anyway. And then when I wasn't doing that, I would just try to watch and consume as much like audio and content on YouTube and TV dramas as much as I can. So probably for that year, I was probably say, you know, 10 to 12 hour days would be quite normal for like the whole year I was there. And I think I, I basically read every single day for an hour for like a period of about a year. So I think the reading every day made a massive difference as well. Yeah. And that that sounds like a lot of language learners dream, like dreams in that like to to be immersing and speaking and reading and stuff in various combinations for like 10 to 12 hours a day. But at any point of it, like a lot of that, except for the reading in the morning and maybe some uh, podcast immersion or whatever, a lot of that wasn't optional. Like, you know, you were in Taiwan, so you it was Mandarin or nothing. Um, mm -hmm. Did did you ever feel like, to, you know, did you did you ever just sort of hit that wall and maybe something it was annoying you or whatever, and you just wanted to go home and just watch something in English? Like, or did you love it the whole time? Um, the, I mean. The first two weeks was really hard. Yeah, I, I was very fr frustrated. Um, trying to, cause, um, so for a bit of background, I've, I've been vegan for a few years. So when I pick up a product in the supermarket in England, I'm used to reading the ingredients on the back to check what's inside it to make sure it doesn't contain, you know, any like eggs or milk or anything like that. And then I, I, I got to Taiwan and I remember there was about a week that started. I didn't really have any friends. My housemates were there. We didn't speak that much. Um, and I'll just go to stuff like 7-Eleven to try and buy food and I couldn't read a lot of the ingredients on the back. So I was like, you know, it was about a week or two when I lived off, you know, like instant noodles and like fruit and crisps, basically. And I was just like, this is going to be, part of me was thinking it's going to be better when I start class and meet people. And part of me was thinking, I've already got a year of this coming up when I kind of was a, really nervous and apprehensive for that time. Um, but once I kind of got over the initial kind of difficulty and I started to make friends there, like actual like friends that we had like meaningful connections and stuff um, and started to meet a lot of people like my course mates and then also other Taiwanese people and became friends with them. I just found getting more and more interested and started loving it more and more the more I went. Um, there was never really a time when I didn't want to immerse. There was I was trying to do Anki for bits and there was lots of times I didn't want to do Anki and then I thought, you know what, I can't be bothered, I'm not going to do Anki, so I just stopped it. And then after that, I found that way more fun. Um, and I think inherently, because what I was doing was all enjoyable things, you know, like reading or watching stuff or speaking for most of it, um, I, I, I found it quite enjoyable. There was a few times when I got fed up with the homework and the grammar drills and stuff that I was just like, this is just pointless, why am I wasting my time with this and just like rush it and then go do something else. But um, yeah, I think that the thing that made me difficult sometimes is a lot of the time when I was in class, I was surrounded by Japanese people because, you know, there was a time when, like, say, eight students in the class, five of them were Japanese, and they'd always speak Japanese in the break. So then I was, like, trying to fight the urge in my brain to try and learn Japanese when I was there. Um, but that was uh, the only time I'd thought about not studying Mandarin. I was like, oh, should I study Japanese maybe? And I was like, no, 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 I'm doing this. I'm here in Taiwan. What am I doing? Let's just focus on this. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, because I, I, the reason I asked that uh, was just that I think there's like this romantic notion of like going to the country and just living your life in that language. But um, like, yeah, it, it can be pretty stressful. I even had a Swedish woman that I met um, here in this city, my, my city, Wollongong. It's about an hour and a half away from Sydney. And she was like, oh, do you know anyone else who speaks Swedish? I'd like, um, And I was like, oh, not in this city i know some people in sydney um and i was like why like what is it a big deal <laughs> like um i thought she was gonna stay like stay that we could start a group or something and she was like no i just feel like since i got here i've just actually become quite tired of having to speak english all the time um which is like a that's a big statement coming from a swede like you know the, they speak English. Most of them speak English extremely fluently, but and she was saying like 
you know, it gets pretty tiring. And like, you know, her Swedish would have been better than your Canton, uh, mm-hmm. than your Mandarin, sorry, um, at the time. So her English, sorry, would have been better than your Mandarin. You get what I'm saying? I mean, I mean, when you when you wrote it like that, yeah, I guess, because I guess putting it in the perspective of now that it's a memory, and you obviously try, try to look back on these things fondly, but there were, I'm just jogging my memory. There were a lot of times when, particularly the first three months, when I'd go out with maybe one or two Taiwanese friends for dinner, and they'd just like be speaking to each other, and I'd be like trying really hard to understand what was going on, and just miss most of it. And I ended up finding that. A lot of the time I was spent, like you know, feeling really, really tired and you know, like low energy levels and just like, oh, like, well, why is this you know, kind of like hurting my brain so much? And it's just so fast I couldn't get my head around it. Um, but then I guess from that point of view, I'd already had the experience of kind of going through it with a different language. So I was kind of like, well, this is just normal. This is what I'm here to do. This is what I want to do. It's still pretty cool that I'm hanging out with people. So I kind of just like slogged through the work times when I kind of was like, oh, I can't be bothered to go out for dinner. I'll just kind of stay in my home and watch TV a bit more. But um, yeah, I, I think there were, there were times like that. And I think when that happened for me, I tended to try and also try and see if I could get situations when it was just me speaking to one person as opposed to like two or three. Yeah. Because for me, that one of the hardest things is when I've got I'm at a table. It's, it's really noisy in a restaurant. Mm-hmm. There's lots of background noise. And there's maybe three or four people speaking in the background and they're all shouting over each other and interrupting mm-hmm. each other and stuff. And for me, I found that like in, compared to just one on one conversation, I found that like, like like five, six, seven times harder to understand. Totally. It's not just you. Um, it's even just two, like even in like a sound studio, two natives speaking to each other is like a very different thing to natives speaking to you. Even if they speak to you at the same speed, which they probably don't, um, there's still just like a lack of context and like you don't get the same like you know uh, ver- non-verbal cues and stuff because they're they're giving it to each other, not to you. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's like. And then when you add all the, the extra sound and stuff, it's actually great. I'm constantly amazed by how much decoding our brains do in our native language when like this person can say something over here and then someone says like what's that movie with you know sandra bullock and george clooney or something and you're like gravity and then you're like keep talking like (laughs) (laughs) like you know and it's that like anyone can do that in their native language it's a it's crazy how much stuff is going on in your brain without you realizing it so Mm -hmm. um yeah doing that would be exhausting but you said like had you ever been to Hong Kong had you had that experience in Cantonese or um so I happened to Hong Kong for for two weeks I went on holiday mm-hmm. with my girlfriend um mm-hmm. and I've also, I've also been to 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 to, to Guang, Guangzhou before in mm-hmm. in in Guangdong province mm-hmm. and that that was probably total three three weeks total I guess of being like in the environment but mm-hmm. when I was with in Hong Kong I spent most of the time speaking to my girlfriend and she because I was at the time I was quite heavily influenced by uh, Benny Lewis, so I kind of did the challenge of I'm going to give up on speaking English for two weeks. So I spent a lot of it speaking to her, and her and one other person, maybe a parent, or maybe you know, like one of her friends or something. And I, I found that to be okay because it was a lot of, most of the time I was just speaking to her, and she was obviously simplifying a lot of it for me. Um, but then like quite a lot of the time I'd actually go out for dinner with her and her friends in England. Mm-hmm. Well, like with with a group of people around me, and this was you know like in Newcastle when we were at university, or like after go out with our friends in London, and be confused as to what was going on because I, they, they, I was like, well, I should be able to understand this, but they're all kind of speaking over each other at the same time. Mm-hmm. So I did go through a similar process, but a lot of it was in England. And mm-hmm. then when I went to Guangzhou, that was towards the end of the two years I studied it for, and. I, I guess they didn't seem to speak as fast as people from Hong Kong. People from Hong Kong seem a bit. Mm-hmm. louder and faster paced in general so i think it's i tend to find it okay and mm-hmm. they were normally quite relaxed in the conversations sometimes they'd speed up and, and get lost but uh, like a lot of the time it tended to be okay by that point yeah okay and so what like you've now you're, you're saying that now that your mandarin is better than your cantonese um yeah. because of that like 18 months of like pretty 
heavy a, a year of heavy heavy immersion um and how does like how does that work with your or, original thing like originally you got into cantonese so to have this connection with your girlfriend and her family and stuff like um are you where do, where do you sit with that and spanish and everything like what are you what's on the roadmap the, the roadmap um well spanish is probably answer that first because that's the easy one i just kind of did that because i was going to mexico mm -hmm. i'll probably revisit it if i go back to a spanish speaking country on holiday for like a month before i go but that's kind of just like parked i'm not really doing that mm -hmm. um for cantonese now i probably watch an episode of something called listen to a podcast of something every like few days mm -hmm. um it is something i definitely want to go back and improve because i feel like at the level i'm at, at the moment it's not good enough to kind of really speak super fluidly in like situations with a lot of people there mm -hmm. and obviously you know staying with her is going to going to be a big part of my life still going forward so it's definitely something that i want to um go back and improve but i also have it in my head that if i kind of focus on mandarin and get that to even higher level now that when i do go back to it later it will be easier because i i found i've noticed sometimes i go to listen to a podcast in cantonese and some of the more common words I actually forgot because I haven't done it in so long. Mm -hmm. But then there's more complicated words that I'm like, oh, I know that because it sounds the same as this mm -hmm. in Mandarin. It's a cog it's a cognate or something. So yep. I, I kind of feel that, like, um, and for a lot of personal reasons, I wanted to try and learn Mandarin just because I'm interested in like quite a lot of media and stuff as well. And now I've got a lot of friends that don't speak English. Um, so I guess the the reason why I was focusing more on Mandarin at the moment, one of them, I guess, is because a lot of people that speak Cantonese or that I did with me also speak English to a very high level, you know, the university in England and stuff. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of people that speak Mandarin don't. So, like, if I want to explain something, you know, like, one of my friends was thought, didn't realise that, you know, the sun and the stars are basically the same thing, so I was trying to explain, like, that it is the same thing, you know, it's just, yeah. like, a big ball of fire, it's just, like, nuclear fusion and, you know, whatever this does whatever and then i couldn't explain it very well in english it's really easy i can go into a lot of detail and just you know but in mm. chinese i was trying to explain what happened and i was just like well, why is this so hard and with, with cantonese i never had that because i could always just go to english and but i will uh, you know this is this is what it is whereas with mandarin to be in a situation when i really want to explain something to someone but physically can't it's very frustrating and that to me was kind of why i thought it might be important to get it to a high level but um, yeah, Cantonese is obviously very important to me, and I do want to go back to it, but I'm not sure on the timeline. Okay. So yeah. it's probably be focusing on them too going forward, and then probably do a bit of backwards and forwards maybe. Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting that like that you say um, is that this sounds kind of bizarre because basically what you just said was uh, I I I wondered why trying to explain nuclear fusion in Mandarin was hard <laughs> it's like well because it's, it's, it's quite a hard topic um, <laughs> like obviously it depends on your knowledge of that subject itself but um so that's yeah that gives us an idea of the kind of level we're talking that you would even start to approach um talking about that because yeah i don't i can't do that in swedish um i mean i, I don't know heaps about it in english but yeah well, my background, I did chemical engineering at university, so I was quite into science from a young age. Yeah. So maybe yeah. lean more towards that. But in, in, the thing is, in Cantonese, I did code switching. Mm. Um, and because a lot of their science classes were in English. Mm. So they'd actually just use the English words for most science terms and not even change the pronunciation. So you just throw in whatever technical terms that are for that thing in English, and that's, you know, okay, that's what Hong Kongers do most of the time anyway. Yeah. So it'd probably be easier in that respect doing it in Cantonese because you just say all the words I already know in my head. Yeah. Um, you said that uh, that I think initially the plan in Cantonese was just to learn some basic stuff and you weren't initially really interested in re learning to read. And at some point you realised how crippling it was to not be able to read yeah. in a language um could you give it talk us through a little bit like how what reading has done for you if that's possible to put into words yeah um i think when people 
talk about reading in this sense they probably have the idea of sitting down and reading with a book but but I guess when you're looking at it in a bigger picture in terms of learning a foreign language and you don't understand the script it's not just that it's just everything that you can't do mm. so when I was learning Cantonese for the longest time for the first nine months I was focusing a lot with things made for learners some of them were you know quite natural speech like Ollie Rich's murder product called Cantonese conversations it's normal full speed speech just transcribed with characters and like the Cantonese version of Pinyin called Yuping. Um and there's stuff like that there's lots of things tailored for, for learners um, but we're using quite natural speech but then you also got things like TV shows and podcasts and stuff which the difference can be quite big and it can be very hard to understand it. Mm. Then you're in the position when you're kind of learning for a few months that I was kind of like well okay well I can you know I can buy another textbook and try to work through that because it has the Yuping there which is like the, the opinion for that like the romanization for the characters yeah um or I can listen to a tv show but but the, the one one seems kind of easy and the one seems kind of hard so like how do I close the gap apart from just doing lots of listening and you know I really think knowing the script is a great way to close the gap because then now you've got access to things like subtitles for videos on youtube you've you know, you can text your friends, you can read comic books, you can read actual books, you can see signs for stuff. So for me, trying to learn a language to a high level and acquire the same vocabulary to an adult without being able to, like, without being able to do something as simple as texting, mm. it, it will be very hard. And other than just, you know, building up conversation skills, the idea that if you want to actually integrate into a group, but you can't like read and write their language, it's just absurd. Like, even if I could, do all that stuff to a high functional level on the spoken side well i couldn't even text my friend and say hey do you want to go to the pub now you know mm. you can't there's no way of organizing stuff unless you switch to english so i really feel that like if you want to be an actual useful member of a group or integrate into a group you kind of have to learn the characters and even when i was in taiwan there were some expats that could speak okay um but couldn't read and write and then they got added to like groups online for organizing stuff and they had no idea what was going on they were like oh look what are they talking about because i don't understand this so you... i think there's lots of limiting things in terms of language learning and getting up your spoken ability but also other than that there's also lots of things of just not being able to function in a group that can get quite frustrating yeah and and then there's just little like um nice to have so like it yeah to give to give an example of the same kind of thing that you're talking about so um i'm on the mailing list for this like um uh swedish guys in sydney um group that just like hang just go to the pub every now and then kind of thing and they they say like they'll send out emails with like the meeting place and um you know the time and like if there's like a booking fee or whatever um and like all, all of that's in Swedish and there's like there's no rule the, the the group isn't I mean technically I'm breaking the rule by being there because I'm not actually Swedish but like the there's no rule about speaking Swedish I've heard people there speaking English because like some of them are, have been, lived here for like 30 years and they don't really remember Swedish that well and stuff but like all the emails are in Swedish um, like there's you know you, you could do it in english but like you said it's hard to integrate and then there's like in movies um even if you could understand the spoken language perfectly um there's a lot of stuff like in certain kinds of movies they'll have like stuff written that like, mm -hmm. like, like just, road signs or yeah, just yeah. things in the background that they know what it means yeah yeah and like and you don't yeah like people looking stuff up on computers and they see a headline that says like you know um like rob great heist in london or whatever and it's like you you're not gonna know what that that was because you can't read um but I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think that's like yeah i because i hear a lot of people say like oh, i just want to learn to say a few basic things i'm not going to learn to read or like maybe they don't say i'm not going to learn to read but they they kind of assume that it's a whole separate part of it but it's like it's really hard to learn the language if if like you can't get that huge input that is that is the written form because like you can read half a book in a day if you've got a bit of time and that's like what 60 70 000 words that will go through your eyes that day which is more i can't than read that long in chinese but okay oh yeah well, maybe yeah it's i've been maybe it's a bit different i normally get tired after an hour to an hour and a half tops but 
Yeah, I think... my record is like two weeks for a book, but that's still pretty slow. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's obviously a bit uh, easier with, with a language related to English. Uh, my record for one day, I think, is five six hours um, wow. reading. But yeah, and I think I finished the whole book in maybe four days. But like, I've, that's pretty rare. And um, and yeah, it's Swedish. It's not it's not the same. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so, have you, have you had this? Uh, you you said that like you stopped doing Anki when you were in um, Taiwan, just wanted to enjoy the what you were doing and everything. Did you ever have you ever felt like? Um, I think this was in the questions I've sent you. Sorry, I've, I know I've asked you some questions that I didn't actually um, tell you I was going to ask. Um, have you ever had this experience where like when you let you kind of let go of trying to catch all the sand like going through your fingers like you just go okay I'm I'm in Taiwan I'm gonna hear the language I'm gonna learn it it's fine like I'm not I don't need to pick up like every little word did you ever feel like that then suddenly took your learning to a new level or did you ever have this kind of peak experience or something where you were like whoa my my Mandarin just hit a new high yeah, I think in terms of trying to catch all the grains of sand falling to your finger, so to speak, it's probably quite a good analogy. I think when I was learning, um, I'll just start with Cantonese probably first, because I, I, I had kind of ironed a lot of concepts out in my head because it wasn't my first time trying to learn a foreign language. Um, so when I was doing Cantonese, a lot of the time I'd watch a TV show and like, you know, I'd, I'd like rewind the same line and like go through it a few times and try to understand a lot more. And then, you know, mm. what does the word sound like and so on and I found by the time I got through an episode of a TV show, if I even finished the episode, I was so tired um, and I just couldn't do it again. So I just went and watched something else in English after that. Whereas after a few months, I just kind of was like, well, I kind of got used to not understanding everything and kind of rewatching shows I'd already seen once before helped a lot and kind of just accepting the noise. Hmm. Um, and when I started doing that, I started, you know, generally exposing myself more and then I felt like my progress picked up. Um, with, with Mandarin in Taiwan, I think there was a time when I was, you know, I was there like, I'm very, I'm, I'm going to Taiwan to learn Mandarin. So I was, I did a few very weird things when I first went there. I was, I spent probably not a lot of time doing Anki, maybe half an hour a day, but I was like, you know, I'm still, grind, I've got to grind up vocab because it's helpful. Um, I did, I did have this concept in my head, whereas if they're not Taiwanese, I don't want to be friends with them. So I didn't speak to my roommates or my course mates really outside of class for like the first three months I was there. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was only trying to be friends with Taiwanese people. And then about halfway through, I kind of was like, you know what? At the end of the day, I have the rest of my life to learn Mandarin. I've only got one year I can go here. So I want to try and have as much fun as I can. And then I started, you know, going out drinking with my Japanese course mates to clubs or bars or, you know, going bowling or going hiking with my friends or just doing anything that sounded fun. But then because of that, the amount of time I was engaged in using the language and actually enjoying spending time with it, like my experience became like for the last six months so overwhelmingly positive that I just you know I think it just made everything kind of so much easier to just kind of enjoy it and just spend the time on the language and then my progress like sped up by quite a lot mm -hmm. um I think when I stopped doing Anki my progress actually sped up by quite a lot because instead of trying to like hammer on these few phrases or whatever I just you know let it go and just expose myself so much um but I think that might, I'm not sure if that was only the case because I was spending so much time in the language or because Anki is not that useful inherently and I kind of question the use of it sometimes because there was lots of times when I sorry about the dog in the background there was <laughs> lots of times where I um, studied a phrase in Anki I knew I studied it in Anki and I came across it in like a book or a text but I forgot what it was in, in the new context and I, I, I know I got the card right but then outside of Anki I got it wrong and that happened to me you know quite a few times and then I, you know, I just thought, well, if I just keep going, I'm going to see the word eventually again and just kind of not worry about it too much. And I think the idea of not worrying made it a lot easier to just kind of relax and absorb content. Yeah. But like, how were you? OK, so you studied Cantonese first and that shares a lot of characters with Mandarin. Um, I, I feel like, I mean, having not studied uh, an Asian language, I... I've always felt like uh, I can kind of get away with not using Anki, but 
I've always just assumed that if you want to learn to read in uh, in Mandarin or Cantonese or Japanese, um, then you'll need to use Anki. Like, how were you able to build up a vocabulary, a reading vocabulary? With and when I was when I was doing Cantonese, I went through a book called so I have it here. Coincidence. Mm -hmm. Remembering the traditional Hanzi by James Heisig. And if you watch a lot of Japanese YouTubers like Matt versus Japan, for example, they always talk about remembering the tradition, remembering the kanji or RTK. Yeah. It's basically the Chinese version of that. Mm -hmm. Um. So when I was learning uh, Cantonese, I'd already done that entire book, and I'd you know I'd, I'd spent a lot of I, I'd, I'd had the whole deck in Anki. So when I completed the book after about three months, I spent a lot of time like still practicing writing the characters out by hand with a practice book when it told me to review them in Anki and I did that for like a year after I finished the book in Cantonese just continuing to rep it out and then when I went to start with Mandarin again I'd already you know like the, most of the characters are the same so a lot of them I'd already written out like a few mm -hmm. times before and, mm -hmm. and then when I went into class and we were you know having to memorize vocab and writing them for like uh like dictation tests and stuff we were having to like write answers to like grammar questions and like we were having to like even in the end of the time in taiwan we were having to like do handwritten essays on different topics of stuff so we spent a lot of time writing as well and a lot of the time i'd forget how to write it and then look up the character and be like oh it's that and then have to write it again i kind of feel like the the, the writing and stuff helps a lot mm -hmm. to kind of make them more clear what they look like in my head. Um, just a lot of memorization, but also I did Anki a lot of the characters like a long time ago and it was just mm -hmm. kind of refreshing them again. Yeah. Um, so when, when I quit Anki at first, I did kind of just stop adding new cards and just continue for that for a few months. And then mm -hmm. later I was just kind of like the reps I was doing per day was so low. I just thought I'll just, I'll just delete the deck mm -hmm. and not do it anymore. Yeah. But I think by the time I got to that, the base was already there. That you know, I could only I can already read quite a lot, and I'm still reading a lot of time. I spent a lot of time every day reading. That it doesn't need it that much. So mm -hmm. the way I look at it, if I read a book in Chinese now, um, there's so much natural repetition across the period of a book that this, if, if I come up against a new word at the start, so for example, I'm reading a, a, a thriller, a kind of fantasy book now, and the word for vampire came up at the start. It's come up like at least a hundred times in the book, so I can I know what it is. I, I, I you know it's not hard to recall at this point because I've seen it so many times. Yeah. So, yeah. so there's a lot of natural repetition built in anyway. Yeah. This is not a bad thing, but it's gonna sound like I'm being insulting, but I'm ex totally the same. It, it sounds like to me that like you're quite obsessive. Um, a little bit. Because yeah, it's a, like it, m most people would not like. Uh, I think a lot of people who were put in a in a uh, that kind of um, situation in Taiwan would would maybe be the sort of person who would do a similar thing. But I think most people would not like try to like do things like not talking to their roommates initially. Even if you stop doing that later, it's like to even make that decision um, at the beginning and and just to to take Cantonese for the first your first foreign language as far as you did um i think it's a, like something people want to do like they go oh, i want to learn a language but they don't actually realize how much of a commitment that takes and so most people when they see how much of a commitment that that takes then that just dies off um is this like i'm guessing this is not the first time that it's um manifested itself there there would have been other things before this yeah, um, I've always had a kind of, uh, I find it very easy to get consumed by like one thing and just want to go kind of all in on that. And like, mm -hmm. there's been various things that did it when I was younger. When I was younger, to be honest, it was mostly video games, which mm -hmm. is arguable of the, you know, how useful it is. But when I was little, it wouldn't be uncommon for me to play a video game for like 10 hours in a day and then do the same thing the next day and then go back to school and be like, oh, damn, I wish I was playing that game again. Mm -hmm. And we like trying to, and then, when I wasn't playing the game, trying to like thinking in my head, oh, what do I want to do to get my character to get like the better sword or whatever, you know? But and then there was other things later at uni, like I, I did a few sports and you know I got into like boxing and stuff a little bit when I was when I was in my third and fourth year, and when I wasn't 
like I'd go to training, you know, like three, four times a week. And then, you know, sometimes in the nighttime, I'd be like watching like tutorial videos on like advice or like shadow boxing in my room or, you know, like, like watching like competitions and stuff on a Saturday. So it was always that thing where I find it very easy to just kind of get, get, get lost and kind of focus on one thing. And it, I'm not, I'm not like the type of person that's like, I'm going to do this and this and kind of like split my time amongst it. It's like, oh, I want to do this thing. So the reason I stopped boxing was because when I went to move after university, I, I started playing Talbotons at a local club and ended up playing for about three teams at the same time because they kept on inviting me to join different ones. And I was like, okay, sure, sure, sure. And I ended up playing like three times a week and then going to training as well. So I, well, when that sort of thing happens, I just kind of go, well, I'm just going to kind of go all in on that one thing. And that seems to be more fun for me. Mm. This is yeah. probably my personality. And that's also why I don't like learning two at the same time because I just yeah. want to focus on the one thing. It's it's totally the same for me. I I think what I find personally really frustrating about it is that it's very hard to control like what thing it is. So it'll be like <laughs> just like when I'm getting good at something and starting to like actually build that to a useful level, something else will just come along and it'll be yeah, that like, to me. <laughs> it'll just be like right when I'm like trying to get a job in that other thing or whatever like uh, you know, I'll, I'll like just to, like, I work as a photographer now and like eight years ago, I was like completely obsessed with photography, would do like anything to make my photos like the smallest bit better. Um, but now like, like sometimes at work, they're like, oh, you know, you did this wrong on the photo. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> and it's like, it's really bad. Like I, I should actually, like, obviously I care as much as I need to for work, but like, I don't actually, like, it, it doesn't actually draw my passion. It's like, if, if it's not written in Swedish, then I'd, I'd it doesn't interest <laughs> me. Um, and so I'm always yeah. worried that like, that it's for me, it's very hard to continue this, that thing. Like, have, have you found have you found that like you got back from from Taiwan is if you found other things like tempting you to not, not since I've come back from Taiwan um I, I, I the biggest thing that was tempting me was when I was in Taiwan I wanted kind of wanted to learn Japanese for a while just because I had so many course mates from Japan and I was you know speaking to them literally every single day and then they'd always switch into Japanese and they'd speak like uh, but oh what's that and I'd be trying to like, listen to like oh can I understand the word and they'd be there like Nintendo and I'd be like oh I understood Nintendo <laughs> <laughs> from when I was a kid <laughs> yeah. um, but ever since I got back to Ta ever since I got back from Taiwan I started looking um, a lot into like Chinese literature and trying to compile things of stuff I want to watch or, or read and like looking at like dramas and things and compiling like loads of stuff that look really cool and then I think I've kind of because I'm, I'm always like looking for new, fresh and interesting content at the moment. It's kind of keeping me engaged and wanting to like, at the moment it's at a really fun level with my Chinese where like m most, a lot of stuff has new words in that I can learn, but also a lot of stuff is like mostly comprehensible. Mm. So I can kind of like pick up, I can kind of jump into a lot of fun stuff and it's really easy to pick up new words. And the thought of going away from that to something when you're basically like understand next to nothing kind of seems a bit, not very appealing to me at the moment just because it's kind of fun in the space I am at the moment yeah um but I know with other stuff before like when um like it not normally when I try to do like a sport or something if I if I get to the point where I invest in it and buy like you know some gloves or some skates that's normally the point where my brain kind of gives up and then goes to something else so I remember I did ice skating um I, I did ice hockey for about three months when I was in my first semester at university yeah. bought skates and then gave up and did something else <laughs> just after that's funny i wasn't i wasn't going to bring this up at all but um uh i've sort of started getting mildly interested in ice hockey um <laughs> not not playing it like for obvious reasons like the nearest i i, I don't think there is an ice rink in my state um, <laughs> um there used there used to be a big one in sydney but i don't think it's still there um but uh like it it came from like uh so i was i was saying to uh you in the video that will be on your channel um 
that like there's like a few things that'll lead to me getting interested in. And so um, with ice hockey, like I read this Swedish book called Bjornstad, uh, which is which means bear town, and it's like a, a city that is like obsessed with ice hockey. And then I saw the series of it, um, and I've been reading the book slowly and like watching the series a couple of times. Um, and so that has uh, ice hockey in it, and um, and then yeah, there's a YouTuber I follow named Emil Hansius who uh, he like particularly loves this one team that he always goes on about and like even though like he never actually talks about what happens in the matches themselves but that's kind of put it on my radar um and then yeah so i like i was watching some of the like 20 i think it was the 2019 world cup like sweden finland highlights and i was like this would be a really good way like i could probably learn more like I could probably learn the vocabulary and the concepts of the game in Swedish, uh, like so that I wouldn't actually know how to describe the same thing in English, which I think would be kind of fun. Um, and then I'm also aware that it's like, oh, it's probably not great to keep to watch heaps of ice hockey because then I'll start caring more about that than caring about Swedish and being like, <laughs> oh, I'll start watching the NHL, which isn't going to be in Swedish commentary and stuff. Like, so yeah. Um, do you think it's because you buy the stuff or like do you think that just always happens at the point that you're also starting to not care about the thing like I don't know, good question <laughs> um i don't think it is because i bought the stuff per se i think it was just that kind of i bought some stuff to do with it and then you kind of it's about the same time time when the the like romance period or whatever or the honeymoon period starts to end and then you start to realize actually this is going to be really really hard hmm. Or like something else takes new and shiny takes my interest away from me you yeah. know and kind of give it up um that only really happened with with ice hockey i think it did happen with boxing just after but that's also because i changed environment i left university i went to a new town um and i did do it a bit then and then it was kind of there was no one really my height so all the people i was sparring were like over six foot and I was like well it really hurts when I get punched in the face so I kind of don't want to I'd rather not anymore there's still a few other other reasons um yeah but yeah I, I don't think it's to do with investing the money per se like with mm. although having said that I think I did buy loads of manga and Cantonese like I, I thought I was buying 30 chapters I actually bought 30 volumes back accident because I <laughs> read it wrong and and then I have a big pile in my room got through about seven of them and then started learning spanish <laughs> yeah but i mean so if, to be fair you had a reason to do that um on that and this will be my last question um uh when so you went from cantonese which you said uh was uh, a difficult thing about cantonese one difficult thing about it is the lack of resources mm -hmm. um and you went from that to spanish which probably like the most or the second most resource rich language in the world um did you did you ever find that there was a bit of resource overload when uh, not 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 really to be honest okay. um in terms of like the availability of like tv shows with subtitles that actually match up because the, i don't know if people know about cantonese there's a spoken written divide so most tv shows that or all tv shows the subtitles are basically written in mandarin and then they have the you know, the spoken language, which is kind of different. Mm -hmm. um, so the fact that like, all the subs matched up, I just kind of found all these cool things and I started getting really excited and just creating lists of things that I wanted to watch and wanted to read and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the, the main, one of the other differences, I guess, would be that in terms of if I wanted to choose a beginner's course with Cantonese, there was like one or two and I just picked one of them mm -hmm. randomly, you know. Whereas with Spanish, is probably at least a hundred, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff out there. But did, um, did you find that to be a good thing? So I... I I think because of, I think this depends on your personality because mm. I know some people have the thing when they complain they buy a lot of say beginners textbooks and they just bounce around and do a little bit of a lot of things. I personally hate that, so I never did it. I I kind of planned in my head a sort of route to what I wanted to do after the first six months. So I was like, okay, well, in month one I'm going to go through a beginners course and I'm going to use this because it looks decent. Mm. In in month two I'm going to use this course because again it looks decent and then. After that, I'm going to start weaning myself into native content and looking at YouTube and movies and books and stuff like that. So I kind mm -hmm. of like planned out a route in my head. And before I started, 
And then when I did start, I was like, right, well, I said I was going to use this book, so I'm going to use this book. There's other resources, but I don't want to waste my time jumping around. So I kind of mm. prefer to do the one thing. And I actually don't like the feeling of doing a little bit here and there, because then for me, it feels like I'm not getting anything done. Mm. So because of my personality type, that I think I am a bit obsessive and I do like to go more and deep into one thing that I didn't feel the temptation to jump into other resources. I was like, oh, well, I'm doing this. So I'm just going to carry on with this. Um, mm. And some of the resources I used were quite interesting. So like the intermediate one I went through was Conversations by, again, Ollie Richards. And mm. it was just like a story in Spanish that was at a reason where everyone could understand it. And I was like, oh, this is actually quite entertaining. So I'll just finish this and then, you know, do do something else after. So I never really got any resource overload with, with Spanish. Yeah. Um, I found it really cool how I could actually find audio books that match up with a book and have text and audio to go with it. That was something that was very new to me and that was quite exciting as well yeah i oh, man i love that in swedish like um it's because like i said before i think it was on i think it was on your one that um basically if it's written in swedish or if it's been translated into swedish then there there probably is an audiobook of it um i love that because i i always read I pretty much always read and listen at the same time or i just listen but i actually rarely read without listening um mm -hmm. Yeah, I find it really good. Um, okay, cool. Um, yeah, it was really good to chat to you, Luke. Thanks for coming it on. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. Um, guys, remember to check out, uh, I guess, like what you call my half of the interview, which is on uh, Luke's channel. Um, check out his channel in general because he's a down-to-earth language learner, doesn't, doesn't claim to do things that he didn't do or can't do or that no one can do. You know what I mean. <laughs> Um, yeah, and uh, look forward to more videos when I get time to make them. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Luke. Guys. See ya. Cheers.